My name is Michelle Craddock. I'm the watershed ecologist with the Massachusetts Division of Ecological Restoration. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with us, uh, the Division of Ecological Restoration um, is a state agency. We're part of the Massachusetts Department of Fishing Game. Um, and our mission is to restore and protect the Commonwealth rivers, wetlands, and watersheds for the benefit of people and the environment. And so we do that kind of in a variety of ways. Um, we do that mainly through aquatic ecosystem restoration. So some of you might be familiar with our, our work in that area, um, including um, wetland restoration, both um, on the coast by uh, removing and replacing undersized culverts that are preventing tidal flushing, as well as through freshwater wetland restoration um, and a lot of the cranberry bogs down here. So some of you might be familiar with the Eel River project, as well as the Tidmarch project that's going on right now. We also do physical restoration and river restoration, so that would be the dam removals. Again, you know, we have a fair amount of projects here on the South Shore you might be familiar with on Third Herring Brook and Jones River and elsewhere. And the program I'm going to speak mostly about today is Streamflow Restoration Program. We also offer technical assistance to municipalities through urban river revitalization and stream crossing service. Just quickly about the Streamflow Restoration Program, we monitor stream flow across the state. Site selection is kind of driven by local request. We have 35 active sites right now and six priority projects where we're actively working to restore stream Stream flow. Why stream flow? What is it? Flow of, it's basically the flow of water in streams, rivers, and channels. And so the flow is coming from a couple different sources. You know, the main source obviously is precipitation. Precipitation comes down as rain or snow. It then, you know, can kind of go a couple different ways. It can fall directly into the river. Uh, it can fall onto the ground and seep into the groundwater where it then can be gradually released into the stream. This is especially important source of water in the summer when there's not a lot of precipitation. Uh, the groundwater seeping back into the stream bed really provides the base flow during that time period. The precipitation can also fall on impervious surfaces and run off directly into the river, uh, kind of forming peaks, and then it washes through and it's gone. So the bottom just kind of shows two examples of what stream flow looks like over a year period. And so these are from the Indian Head River on the left in Hanover and Eel River on the right in Plymouth. And so you can see the stream flow, you know, it's typically higher in the, the winter and spring. We have a lot of precipitation and snow melt in the summer kind of drops off. Um, you know, it's being fed ma mainly by the groundwater and then starts to rise back up in, in the fall again. Um, and this data is from 2016, so it is during the drought. So, you know, you can, you can see even with the drought, we still see those kind of seasonal patterns. Uh, the pattern on the right is a little bit different because it's from Eel River and that's fed mainly by groundwater from the Plymouth Carver Aquifer there. So that's more of a kind of straight, you know, straight-ish line with some peaks for precipitation, um, which is a little bit different than what you're seeing in Indian Head. And so why is stream flow important? Stream flow is considered the master variable in streams and is the primary driver of stream ecology and health. Without water in your stream or without enough water in your stream, you know, it's hard to be concerned with water quality or the habitat quality. Flow is strongly correlated with obviously the volume, availability, and connectivity of habitat. And when you have high flows, um, the river can spill over its banks, it can go into the floodplains and the riparian zones, and really kind of connect that habitat for the aquatic organisms living in the stream. On the contrary, when stream flow is low, it's obviously disconnected from the floodplain habitat. Sometimes when the flow is low, it can drop below the banks, and so it kind of limits the habitat that's available there. But that's all part of the natural flow region. Water quality and temperature are also really tied to stream flow. Obviously, when you have lower stream flows that can tend to concentrate things like nutrients and other contaminants in the water body, it can also lead to increased temperatures when there's lower flow because you know, the, the water gets more shallow, it's quicker to heat up. Um, and during low flow periods, sometimes the groundwater that's usually cold isn't coming in either, and that can lead to increased temperature. Geomorphology, which basically is how wide the river is, how deep the river is, and kind of how it winds through the landscape is also really influenced by stream flow. So we see in the high flows, there's a lot of sediment movement and erosion and in low flows, it tends to get deposited and that forms how the channel looks. Stream flow is also really tied to the availability and type of food resources. Again, that kind of connectivity to the floodplain. And it's also tied obviously to biological cues like fish migration and spawning. A lot of those species are really kind of used to the seasonal flows and stream flow and have tied their, their life history and life patterns to changes in stream flow. I'm sure you can imagine 
mentioned there's a lot of factors that can impact stream flow. One of the, the big ones, obviously, is water withdrawals and water use. And this can be for a variety of things, whether it's for drinking water in your town or um, irrigation of golf courses or agriculture. All of those things can impact stream flow. And that goes for both surface and groundwater. Surface water, if your town uses a reservoir or um, an agricultural operation has a pond on their property, obviously withdrawing water from that can, can draw that water body down. And if there's an outlet stream from that, that could impact the amount of water that's available to flow in the stream. We see the impacts are obviously especially significant in the summer when water is at its peak use and stream flows naturally at its lowest. They're really working against each other in the summer time period. Private wells, which have really come out as potentially a big issue uh, with the drought this summer, could also impact stream flow. Some people don't use municipal water, so they're on their own private wells in their yards, but depending on how deep the well is and how close it's located to a stream or to the town's water supply that also can have a real impact on stream flow. Urbanization and impervious surfaces can also really impact stream flow. The more impervious surfaces you have, uh, there's going to be less infiltration of the precipitation into the groundwater. With less infiltration into the groundwater, that's less water that's available for the streams in the summer. I think we'll hear a little bit about that more in the next talk. Dams can also have a real impact on stream flow, both regulated and unregulated dams. Aside from the other impairments that dams cause, like reduced water quality and increased temperatures and the impoundments behind them and the fact that they block fish passage in a lot of cases. They also can impact stream flow, especially during drought. We saw this past summer, the impoundments or the ponds behind dams, the levels were declining throughout the summer. So eventually they dropped below the spillways of those ponds or below the dams. And so there was no spill going over them, resulting in low or minimal flow. Interbasin transfers can also impact stream flow. So that's basically taking water from one watershed or basin and exporting it to another. So a good example of that is Silver Lake and the Jones River watershed, Brockton taking their drinking water there and exporting it to the Taunton River watershed. If that water was kept locally and used locally, a good proportion of it would be going back into the groundwater through septic systems, other uses like that. But when it's transported out of the basin, it's basically completely removed from kind of that the hydrologic cycle in that watershed. Climate change can obviously have an impact on stream flow. Um, they're predicting that as the climate changes, the uh, precipitation events are going to become shorter and more severe. And those storms that are really intense, but at short duration, it doesn't allow a significant significant portion of it to infiltrate into the groundwater. A lot of it just ends up running off. And that's kind of what we saw this summer in the drought is that when we did have precipitation, it was a you know, really quick storm and a lot of that water just ended up running straight off into the streams and didn't provide that kind of base flow to the groundwater. Drought, obviously when we have uh, decreased precipitation, uh, that can show up the negative impacts on our stream flow. And I'll talk a little bit about that on our next slide. Drought can decrease stream flow and base flow. During decreased periods of precipitation, there is going to be less groundwater recharge. So that's, you know, just basically less water going into the groundwater to recharge it. At the same time, if uh, people are using that groundwater for, uh, you know, irrigation or drinking water, that can lead to declining groundwater as, as well. And in extreme cases, that means that the groundwater level could actually be below the elevation of the stream bed. And again, it can lead to decreases in surface water elevation, so there's no water spilling over a dam or out of a pond downstream. It can be declining water quality, as discussed before, in terms of concentration of nutrients and pollutants and decreased salt oxygen in the streams and increased water water temperature as the water heats up, as it becomes shallower, as well as there's less cold groundwater seeping into the stream. So what that kind of, you know, results in is uh, reduced habitat quantity and quality for anything that's living in those streams, whether that's a fish or macroinvertebrates or other aquatic organisms. Um, and they really get subject to, you know, a lot of predation and stress as their habitats dry up and the water quality decreases. They don't have a lot of places to go. And so during extended periods of droughts, you can see streams turn into a series of just pools or dry up completely, basically straight those aquatic organisms. And so I'm just going to show you a couple quick pictures of some extreme examples of the drought this summer that we saw um, on the south shore. And so these streams are impacted by a variety of stressors. And I should have said earlier on the slide about what impacts stream flow is that it's usually a combination of all of a lot of those different things impacting a stream, typically not just one in uh, isolation, but a combination of many with maybe a primary one driving the impacts to stream flow. So on the left here is Third Herring Brook in Norwell, which was dry for for more or less several months at a time this summer. Um, 
the site here is directly downstream of a dam. The elevation of the water body behind it had dropped below the spillway, so it essentially just wasn't spilling all summer. And so the stream was dry there. Further downstream, there are some um, groundwater withdrawal concerns that also complicate the issue. <laughs> we have seen dry periods here in the past, but definitely not for this duration. On the right is First Herring Brook and Situate. Again, this is downstream of their drinking water reservoir. And due to the drought, there was obviously no water spilling over the dam, and they weren't releasing any water. A couple more quick examples are Mattapoisett River in Mattapoisett and the Weir River in Hingham. Again, these bo rivers both do, you know, have gone dry in the past, but they were dry for much longer periods of time this summer. The main stressor here really is the groundwater withdrawals for water supply. That was depressing. What do we do about it? You know, I'm going to give you a brief overview of a lot of different kind of methods that can be used to try and improve stream flow and drought resilience. And I'll preface that by saying that it, none of these are easy or quick things to implement. They take time and creating drought resiliency, you know, it does take some planning, but hopefully this gives you an idea of, of some things that can be done. So the first thing that you know, we work a lot on at DER um, with other partners is surface water releases and dam management. So we don't just remove dams. We, there are some dams that are not going to be removed. So we work on kind of improving the conditions downstream of those dams. Typically, you know, that requires modeling and working with a lot of different stakeholders because different people have different interests, whether it's a water supply that needs to be balanced with the downstream needs, or it's a recreational lake that you need to balance people's ability to water ski, or if they're using uh, spring fall drawdowns and spring refills to manage their aquatic plants, invasive plants, you need to be able to balance those concerns. That can take some time to get stakeholders on board, but the main goal is to be able to manage the reservoir or lake so that water can be released. That's sufficient for aquatic organisms to, to live and survive, especially during periods of drought when it becomes even more difficult to balance those needs. Stormwater management that improves groundwater recharge is also a really important way to improve stream flow in your area. So just basically letting more water recharge to the groundwater so that it's available to kind of replenish the streams when there's not a lot of precipitation is really important. Demand management on the water supply side and watering restrictions. That's kind of one of the quickest and uh, cheapest ways to um, improve stream flow and drought resilience during periods of drought. Uh, I'm sure, you know, everyone here I'm sure it was under a uh, watering restriction this summer. And towns like Situate, for an example, were able to reduce their summer water use by 30% when they started implementing watering restrictions uh, several years ago. So it can have a real immediate impact and free up some water for, for stream flow. Reducing wastewater inflow and infiltration. Basically, you know, the pipes that carry wastewater out can be really leaky. And so a lot of groundwater can just be infiltrating those pipes. So working with water departments on reducing the amount of groundwater that's seeping into those pipes can potentially in some cases free up a lot of water as well. Reusing water, or gray water, you know, especially for irrigation, another great way uh, to reduce water use and um, improve stream flow. Sam's going to talk a little bit more about conservation later, but again, a lot of these kind of touch on the conservation of water um, as a way to improve stream flow. Exploring new wa water supply source, as was mentioned before, you know, the South Shore, you know, they have a lot of kind of small constrained water supplies and can be tough as a lot of these communities are continually building. Driving down here today, I see tons of houses going up. So, you know, the water supply is pretty much staying the same, but the communities are expanding. So how do you, how do you address that? New water supply sources, whether that's a regional source or, you know, like the MWRA or something different is always an option to consider, you know, whether that's just in the summer to supplement summer use or year round. You can also optimize water withdrawals. So a town that has several groundwater wells, uh, maybe some are further from a stream or a wetland and they can pump more heavily from that one during the summer or certain times of the year so that more water is available for the streams. So these all require, you know, a lot of work with the town, water departments, and municipal level, evaluate whether they're possible. Get dam and flow barrier removal um, is also something that can improve stream flow. As I mentioned before, water levels can often drop below spillway, so there's no spill over a dam, but a lot of dams also create large impoundments behind them, and those impoundments can have high levels of evaporation off of them, so there is some water loss there as well. And additionally, uh, land acquisition and conservation. If you buy land, can't be developed upon, so there's no one going to be there taking water. It also keeps that land as most likely uh, a pervious surface so that there's more infiltration there. And so that's just overview of some kind of actions that can be done. Um, as I said, they're easier said than done, but that does give you an idea. Uh, there's also, you know, some policies that you can implement um, that in the long run will help improve stream flow and drought resilience. You can pass a stormwater utility or a bylaw. So the utility basically just
allows money to be available so that a town can improve their stormwater infrastructure. Use a water use restriction bylaw. I think a lot of towns around here probably already have that, but that just allows you the ability to implement watering restrictions and sign fines to them for people that don't follow them. Private well bylaws are something that are not especially popular, but um, you know can be really effective. Um, some towns in Massachusetts have done this. And basically what that does is just applies the water restrictions to private well users as well as the municipal water supply users. Towns can create a drought management plan for water supplies. And so some towns do have these, um, some don't. So basically what that just does is it applies a set of actions to different levels of drought, however you want to declare levels of drought. So that could be different severity of watering restrictions based on elevations in a reservoir or elevations of groundwater, or it could be based on you know, the state's different levels of declaration of drought. In the drought this summer, the state did issue um, a fair amount of press releases that recommended if your town is in a drought warning that you should be in a complete outdoor watering ban. But if you're in a drought advisory, you can we recommend that you limit watering to one day a week. So stuff like that, so that when you are in a drought or facing a water shortage, you're not grambling to figure out what the plan is. You kind of have it already set in place and have some uh, actions tied to it. You can also encourage low impact development and water neutral development. Basically what that means is encouraging development that's going to allow infiltration um, and water neutral development really refers to creating development where the water use is going to be offset in some other way, whether that's through efficiency measures in the development or elsewhere in the town. And so I just wanted to give a quick example of some of the projects that we're working on to improve stream flow. Um, the first is a project you might be familiar with that making seasonal stream flow releases at First Herringbrook and Situate. Um, and we've worked with a lot of great partners on that project, including the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. And the towns have been great partners as well. We've also worked with Nature Conservancy um, and many others over the year. First Herringbrook, if you don't know, is a tributary to the North River in Situate. It's a historic herring run. The brook and the associated reservoirs along it provide the water supply or provide portions of the water supply for the town of Situate. And we began monitoring stream flow there in the early 2000s, actually, um, and observed frequent periods of no flow downstream of the dams. And there also were no herring were observed there. So we worked with a variety of partners on a stream flow release plan. And again, this wasn't a quick process. Um, you know, we really needed to balance the water supply and stream flow goals. So that involved modeling to understand what kind of releases we could make uh, without compromising the water supply of the town. So eventually we began implementing that in uh, 2012 and herring immediately came back in the spring of 2012 in the spring that year so that would be a success story but I do want to say that as part of that whole process the town implemented those watering restrictions that I spoke about earlier to allow some water to be freed up for the releases and well as to increase their water supply. We also uh, worked on a project once out in western Massachusetts, again a dam release plan where there's a lake managed for recreational uses there. It's a big a lot of water skiers and boats there and uh, they also conduct fall drawdowns where they draw down the lake level by three to six feet, leave it like that for the winter and then refill it in the spring in an effort to get rid of aquatic vegetation in that pond. We did monitoring with the Watershed Association out there and found that there are frequent periods of no flow downstream of these dams um, because they were really just focused on managing it for the recreational uses and keeping the lakes high. And we worked with a variety of stakeholders from the town that's managing the dam to the lake associations and the watershed associations and the homeowners on the pond to kind of come up with, with a, a compromise that balanced the downstream flow concerns as well as the lake recreational use concerns. We began implementing that a couple years ago and immediately saw, you know, there were no longer any periods of low flow, of uh, zero flow there. And we saw the macroinvertebrate community really bounce back after a couple of years of implementation. And just to uh, summarize, stream flow is really, it's very important and it's the primary driver of the stream ecology and health. As I mentioned in the talk, you know, many factors can imp impact stream flow. It's usually a variety of factors and these can all be amplified during periods of drought. So there are a variety of tools to help alleviate the impacts of drought on stream flow and water supply. Sometimes they're long-term things need to be working on, but utilizing multiple tools will really be the most effective way to get at that. And the most effective tools will also depend on the specific stressor in your stream. So whether that's groundwater withdrawals or surface water withdrawals, or if it's impervious surfaces. So just understanding the factors impacting your stream flow is really important as well.